Thank you for downloading this sermon from Trinity Presbyterian Church in Spartanburg, South Carolina. For more information about Trinity, visit our website at www.trinityspartanburg.com. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. First Peter chapter 5, 12 through 14, the last chunk of First Peter. This is the word of the Lord, it is eternally true. Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we pray as we come to your word that you would uh, give us humility of mind. Father, that we would be uh, like hungry children longing for a meal. And that you would, by uh, your good grace, give us nourishment. Father, we pray that you would help us to take our minds off this world and put them on things above. Father, we pray that you would bless us richly for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before I get to the sermon, I want to say thank you for bearing up under all of the Restrictions and strange directives that the elders and deacons have put in place. Uh, We only have a few rule breakers today I see out there, but um, that's okay. Uh, We'll talk to you later. (laughs) But we are doing this so that, um, as I've said before, so that we can show deference to people who have more expertise than we have. Okay, and that's why we do it, and it's also to show kindness to the weaker brother in the midst of our assembly, whose conscience may be more bound than yours by the things that are going on in our state and nation. And so, um, continue to keep those things in mind. This is going to be a week-by-week thing that the elders and deacons get together and try and decide what to do. Um, and what's, what's best to do next. And uh, I, I'm, I know and have heard that you all have various opinions on these things. I know that. Um, but please follow the direction of your elders and deacons. We would appreciate it. So with that, let's turn to the Word of God and First Peter chapter 5. We've made it to the end of this book. We've worked through the whole thing. And now, you know, that. We often think of the last portion of a book or the very first portion where, where you know, there are salutations or greetings is sort of a throw-off part of the book. But nonetheless, that part of the book is also inspired by God and is profitable for correction and reproof and training in righteousness. And, uh, and there's meat left on the bones even in these sections that we can, we can pick up. And so... We remember that these, this book, this letter, has been written t- by the Apostle Peter uh, to the churches in, in Asia Minor where there's been, clearly there's been persecution against those brothers. They're having to uh, live their faith out and it's costing them greatly. And so that, that, that theme is all throughout this book. And the Ap- Apostle's purpose in writing was undoubtedly to encourage those churches in the midst, in the heat of persecution and suffering. The letter started with the apostle assuring these battered Christians that they were protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, even though now for a little while you have been distressed by various trials. That's First Peter 5, uh, 1, the first, uh, or 5 and 6. So right at the beginning, he's saying you're protected by the power of God, even though for a little while you're now suffering. As with 
letters or emails we might write to others, um, Peter closes his letter with greetings and a last word of encouragement. He mentions that this letter was written through Sylvanus. Sylvanus. In other words, it was written down by an amanuensis, which is a, a fancy word for somebody who takes dictation for somebody else. An amanuensis, someone who puts to the page words dictated by the author. This man is described by Peter as our faithful brother. So who is Sylvanus? Well, in the book of Acts, and some of the epistles, we learn that Sylvanus, who is sometimes called Silas, right? If, it's, if you come across Silas or Sylvanus, you're likely talking about the same man. We find out that he was a co-worker and companion of the apostle Paul. Now, we're in Peter's letter, and he's helping out Peter, but most of what we read about Silas and, or Sylvanus was that he accompanied the Apostle Paul. In the book of 2 Corinthians, we learn that Sylvanus preached the Word of God. For the Son of God, it says, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Sylvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in, uh, yes in him. So those three men are also mentioned in the opening of both of Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. Here's the opening of 1 Thessalonians. Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy to the churches of the Thessalonians and God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you in peace. In Acts 15, Silas, that shortened form of Sylvanus, was chosen to accompany Paul and Barnabas to Antioch with the communication of that first council of the apostles. And then in Acts 16, we learn that it was Sylvanus who was with Paul in the Philippian jail. Right? It's Sylvanus who's with Paul in the Philippian jail. Acts 16, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. So Sylvanus in Acts is also described as a leading man among the brethren and also designated a prophet when he preached in Antioch. So a prophet, a preacher, a companion to the apostles is uh, listed at the beginning of books along with Paul and Timothy I mean, this was a man that was deeply, deeply concerned about the churches and deeply integrated with the leaders of the churches. Though most of what we read about Sylvanus is in conjunction with the Apostle Paul, at some point he was together with the Apostle Peter. Peter and Paul spent time together in their ministry, as we know as well, but at this point, uh, Sylvanus is the one that Peter has dictated this, uh, this uh, letter to. It's wonderful to see that God used specific men for these purposes during this time. There were faithful men that we read about in Scripture. At one moment, Sylvanus is singing hymns in jail with Paul. Another, he's prophetically speaking in Antioch. And at another, he's simply taking dictation. Right? He goes from, from the, the, uh, what we would deem the, the heights of importance down to um, the, the less importance, the, the mundane, right? taking dictation. It's clear that Sylvanus, though, not an apostle, was powerful, used powerfully by the Lord for the strength of the church during, during those days. He was a Christian, and so his life was dedicated to Christ and the church. Let me say that again. He was a Christian, and so his life was dedicated to Christ and the church. That seems like a stupid thing for me to settle on and say, doesn't it? But how many Christians do you know whose lives are not settled on Christ and the church? A lot, right? Uh, he was a Christian, so his life was dedicated to those um, of, of Christ's church and to Christ himself. We should honor those men who came alongside the apostles, right? They risked their lives, they risked their necks for the gospel. And without these men, without these men, the ministry of the apostles would not have been as far-reaching as it was, 
Perhaps we wouldn't have had this letter from the Apostle Peter. I don't think we need to make too much. You, you notice, in, if you're looking at the NASB, you notice in verse 12 that it has that parenthetical statement. And every time you come across it, it reads like, man, there must be some controversy about whether or not Sylvanus is faithful because he puts in this parenthetical statement. So, you know, that's how I regard him. And uh, we sort of read it in that, but um, it's not as if there's a question about Sylvanus is faithful. And so Peter feels the need to refute those who might question him. I think he's just making sure to say something here so that it doesn't look like the amanuensis is praising himself, right? This is being dictated to him, and he's, you know, and, and he says, you know, through Sylvanus, our faithful brother, and right then he just wants to, to uh, take away the tension that uh, someone writing that letter might feel. And so I think it's nothing more than that. Next, Peter says that he has written to you, to the churches in Asia Minor, briefly, exhorting and testifying the true grace of God. Now that's how the Apostle Peter summarizes the content of his letter. It is an exhortation and testimony about God's grace. It is good news about a God who redeems his sinful people by his sovereign choice. Not because of some work that they've done somewhere along the line to impress God or put God in their debt. Right? The grace of God is our salvation. As Peter said early in the, the letter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the grace of God. That's the work of God on behalf of wicked and impotent sinners. That's the grace of God. Scripture reveals that we are not saved by our own striving, by harshly treating our bodies, right? By performing feats that impress God and put Him in our debt. Luther said, to want to merit grace by works that precede faith is to want to appease God by sins. You understand what he's saying there? Right? To want to merit grace by works that precede faith is to want to appease God by sins. Without faith, it's sin. There is no way to impress God prior to faith, prior to the work of, of regeneration in the heart. Salvation for dead sinners who are incapable of pressing God in any way must be all of God. It must be all of His work. Here's a concise summary of the situation we were in and the glory of the grace of God. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen? That's a glorious passage. Titus 3, 3 through whatever, 7. Read Titus 3, 3 through 7 tonight before you go to bed. And just think about the glory of the grace of God. Memorize it so that during the week as you clean countertops, you can recite it to those who are around you. Right? Whatever it may be that you're doing. This is our hope, as it was those Christians that the Apostle Peter was writing to in the first century. It is the only hope of the, of, of the dead. It's the only hope of the impotent. It's the only hope of sinful men and women. 
Peter exhorts them then to stand firm in the grace of God. In other words, don't be blown about by every new teaching that comes along. Do not get distracted from salvation by grace alone. Do not walk away from the glorious teaching that God is the one who has done what is necessary for your salvation. We are to stand firm in this old teaching. We are to stand firm in what it says in Scripture. We are to stand firm on, on an old foundation that has no cracks in it at all. It is a solid foundation, and we stand firm on that. We're, we're to stand firm on the doctrine of God's grace. The devil, as we looked at last time, will try to get us to doubt the grace of God. He'll tempt us to think uh, we are beyond hope. That we have sinned too much. That we have, in sinning, sabotaged our faith and our standing with God. In fact, he'll make us think salvation is not of grace, but of works. Luther said, the devil is forever attracting people to good works to make sure that they do not reach the point of thinking that they need the grace and mercy of Christ. The devil is trying to trap people in thinking this is all about good works. And it keeps them from the grace and mercy of Christ. Keeps them from thinking they even need it. And so Peter says, stand firm in grace. After a long day of sin. You know, some of those long days of sin. Do you have long days of sin? Do you have days that are anything other than that? Because if you do, I want to know what your secret is. I haven't quite figured it out. After a long day of sin, pour out your heart to God in repentance and remind yourself of the grace of God. Remind yourself of the fact that He saves sinners. The grace of God that saves you. We, we have to preach the gospel all, all the time to ourselves. If we don't preach the gospel of God's grace to ourselves, then the devil will be pleased and will make us think that by our performance we can impress God and work our way to heaven. That's what will happen. And for about two minutes as you get to work, you'll think you can actually impress God. And then after two minutes, you'll be like, I'm undone. There's nothing I can do that will please God. So we have to preach the gospel to ourselves. So often we assess ourselves by our performance. Perhaps that is the predominant way that we we assess ourselves, but in addition to looking at the fruit we bear or don't, we have to preach the gospel, the good news, the outlandish, stupendous news that, that God saves sinners. Good news is, is that God is gracious. He gives life to dead God haters and removes their sins from them as far as east is from west. And he does so because his character is gracious. He does so because he desires to be gracious. He does so because without, without that, uh, we would all be undone. Again, Luther says, if you're talking about grace, you have to go to Luther. That's why I'm that's why I'm quoting Luther this morning. Right? Here's what Luther said. Christ our Lord, to whom we must flee and of whom we must ask all, is an inexhaustible well of all grace. Even if the whole world were to draw from this fountain enough grace and truth to transform all people into angels, still it would not lose as much as a drop. This fountain constantly overflows with sheer grace. Whoever wishes to enjoy Christ's grace, and no one is excluded, let him come and receive it from Christ. Let him come and receive it from Christ. So, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm in grace, in the grace of God. Remember and believe and rest in the love of God. The love of God that has rescued you from the domain of darkness. The Apostle Peter next brings greetings from she who is in Babylon. It's assumed, I mean, I read, I read different takes on this. 
Some say he's speaking from that area, Babylon. The, um, and others say, no, he's making a reference to Rome uh, and calling Rome Babylon. Um, it's assumed, I think, for the most part, that it's a reference to the church that is in Rome. And from there, Peter is, is writing this letter. Why does Peter refer to Rome as Babylon? Because uh, Rome is no friend to God's people. That's why he refers to it as Babylon. Uh, remember, Nero is emperor. Uh, just as Babylon was no friend of God's people, right? Babylon dragged God's people off their land with hooks in their noses, right, into exile. And so I think he's using it as a, as a, as a metaphor, as a, uh, a remembrance of, of persecution. He's using it as a way to encourage, in other words, uh, Harold says this, one of the commentators, when Peter refers to Rome as Babylon, he is reminding his readers that they should never envy their brethren because they lived in a great metropolis with its economic, social, and cultural wealth and its majestic imperial splendor. In reality, Rome was a painted harlot and her spirit was as oppressively set against the Christians of Peter's day as had been the spirit and armies of the Babylon of old against the Jews they carried away into captivity. So in other words, he's reminding these persecuted Christians that the grass is not always greener on the other side. Perhaps they were tempted to think highly of Rome as we might be tempted to think highly of New York City. Right? I've often remarked that when one is in a city like that where there are banners uh, for this cultural event and tall buildings and and masses of people and celebrities walking up and down the roads, and just that cosmopolitan atmosphere, it is easy to forget God. We can become so impressed with the accomplishments of man that we, we just forget that God is the one who sustains all things. Right? And it's easy to forget God because... Everything there in the city is, is meant to be a shrine to man's achievements. The cities of man, like the Tower of Babel, are man's attempt to raise himself up to heaven. It's an achievement without humility, and it's the very opposite of grace. Right? The grace that comes to Jesus and says, I am dead, I can't do anything. And the hubris of New York City that believes that they can rule the nations, and build a tower metaphorically up to heaven. So in calling Rome the great city Babylon, Peter is rightfully diminishing her glory. She's a harlot. She's an enemy of, of God. But in that city is Christ's church even still. And they greet their brothers in Asia Minor who, are, Minor who are suffering for the name of Christ in the same way. Also sending his greetings to the churches of Asia Minor is Peter's spiritual son, Mark. You remember that one, at one time, Mark was the companion of the Apostle Paul. But there was a breach in their relationship uh, when Mark abandoned the work. Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas and took off. And that abandonment was so egregious to Paul that eventually led to a breach between Paul and Barnabas over Mark. And at that point, Barnabas took Mark with him and Paul took away Silvanus, we already talked about. We do not know... Um, I mean, we do know, we know very clearly that there was a later reconciliation between Paul and Mark. But perhaps Mark, now thinking through this, who had abandoned the mission, had found a sympathetic friend in Peter, who himself had abandoned his Lord. And that's why Paul and, and Mark come close together in the work of ministry. They have that shared experience. Peter was able to share the grace of Jesus Christ with Mark, who would have needed to hear of that grace of Jesus Christ. And so, there are these greetings. Mark is with 
Peter and sends his greetings. Finally, we make it to the last verse of the book. And the apostle Peter writes, Greet one another with a kiss of love. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Elsewhere in Scripture, in Romans, in First and Second Corinthians, and in First Thessalonians, we are exhorted to greet one another with a holy kiss. Right. So the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, both use this. This um, they both command this uh, greeting. Six times in the New Testament, we are called to show love toward one another by a kiss. Now. Those are frightening words for a number of reasons today, right? First, germs. That's the obvious thing. That's the elephant in the room, right? Germs. Social distancing has for a time made this command uh, impossible to fulfill literally or even figuratively. I mean, we can't even just hug. We can't shake hands. But more, more intense than that, I think, is this reason that we balk at this command of Scripture. Uh, physical affection, perhaps most for men, is marred today by the open embrace of homosexuality by our culture. Men are afraid to show even an emotional connection between one another, let alone physical affection, because they do not want to signal something to a culture that will interpret their actions as an indication of of sexual attraction. That is shameful. Third, we do not believe in the importance of physical touch. We just don't believe in the importance of physical touch. Anybody, though, who has been cut off from other people for a time, whether because of health issues or jail time or just time apart and, and, and distance, knows how wonderful physical touch, a hug, a kiss, even a shake of the hand can be. Putting a hand on a shoulder can convey kindness and sympathy to those who are suffering so that we can show kindness and sympathy without even a word. Right? That's the power of touch. And that leads us to a question. Does the Apostle Peter really mean a kiss? Or is he using that as a stand-in for any sort of physical affection? Or is this one of those passages where we get on our um, hermeneutical big boy pants and we say, well, to that culture, this was the form. It no longer has that meaning in our culture. And so we do different things that are, you know, we could get into that debate and leave out the question of whether Holy Spirit inspired Scripture for all time and other matters of hermeneutics. But, does, but here I am asking the question. Does Peter really mean a kiss, or is he using that as a stand-in for any sort of physical affection? Calvin interprets it broadly. From his commentary on Romans 16.16, 16, he says, it is clear from many parts of Scripture that a kiss was a usual and common symbol of friendship among the Jews. It was perhaps less used by the Romans, though not infrequent. Only it was not lawful to kiss women, except those only who were relatives. It became, however, a custom among the ancients for Christians to kiss one another before partaking of the supper, to testify by that sign their friendship, and then they bestow their alms that they might in reality and by the effect confirm what they had represented by the kiss. All this appears evident from one of the homilies of Chrysostom. Right? So what he's saying is that, is that they would be approaching the Lord's table and there would be this ceremony of kissing one another, holy kiss, kiss on the cheek, right? Kissing one another and then bringing their alms, right? and then coming to the table. Now think about the sociological richness of doing that. Think about somebody that you had an argument with in the foyer, you're sitting next to, and you show them the kiss of love.
where you come to the table, a table where we are not supposed to be divided, we're supposed to come together in unity. Think of the, think of the glorious uh, power of that. Now, Calvin goes on, he says this, Paul, however, seems not here positive, positively to have enjoined a ceremony. It's like he's not telling us to kiss, but only exhorts them to cherish brotherly love. And he distinguishes it from the profane friendships of the world, which, for the most part, are either disguised or attained by vices or retained by wicked arts and never tend to any good. And so what he's saying is this kiss of love or this brotherly love that the church demonstrates sets it apart from the world where friendships are built upon vices, right? Friendships are built upon rioting, right? Friendships are built upon golf, or whatever, you know, activities you can do together. And not that golf is necessarily a vice. It can become a vice, I guess. Got any golfers here? <laughs> um, uh, so Calvin quotes Chrysostom. And if you know who Chrysostom is, well, he's another old dead guy. Fourth century bishop of Constantinople. In his homily in Romans, he says this, and I find it really helpful. To cast out of them, by this salutation, by this command to greet one another with a kiss of love, all arguing that confuse them and all grounds for little pride. So he's saying it casts out grounds for pride. That neither the great might despise the little, nor the little grudge at the greater, but that haughtiness and envy might be more driven away when the kiss soothed down and leveled everyone. Right? So those that hate the rich and the mighty and those that are mighty who despise the poor, by that action in that worship service are leveled. Leveled. So Chrysostom derives from this exhortation a denunciation of pride. It's humbling to kiss a superior on the cheek. It's humbling to kiss an inferior on the cheek. It's humbling to speak of superior and inferior. Right? I think it's quite helpful to think about this denunciation of pride. Those we dislike, we have a tendency to keep at a distance. Those also that we think are unworthy of our benevolence, we tend to avoid as well. We size people up and in many cases are unwilling to bring ourselves down and equally unwilling to bring somebody else up. And the holy kiss or the kiss of love militates against that. That kind of intimacy can only come out of a heart that's been warmed or that's been softened with the love of Christ. That kind of humility. And just as I've said about raising my hands in worship, so it is true of the kiss of love. I often raise my hands to discipline the cold, to discipline the cold heartedness of my pride or my cold heartedness in worship. Right? And so I lift my hands to remind myself that it is before God that I'm singing. Right? And His majesty is great. And He, he is worthy of, of me praising Him with, with more than mumbling lips. And so the same thing could be with the discipline of physical touch. Right? Discipline our cold hearts. Many of us need the discipline of physical touch and warm greetings to, to break up that rocky heart that we live with. We need it broken up. The kiss is to be one of love, not like Judas's treacherous and treasonous kiss, a kiss where he betrayed his Lord to those who were coming to arrest him. They are to be chaste, not lascivious, right? That's what a holy kiss is. It's not... Um, it's not to be lustful in any way. It's to be a, a greeting of brotherly love. They are to be an expression of love, not lust. So we could reduce this exhortation down 
just to be affectionate in your greetings, that this is expressed, you know, and, and this is expressed today in our culture by, or was, by the handshake. And that would be an application, but let's not spiritualize and relativize every command of Scripture. Maybe there is something to a holy kiss. Perhaps in a homosexualized culture, but no more so than Rome was homosexualized. Come on. You know that, right? Um, A kiss on the cheek of two men or of two women that is in no way sexual could be a powerful witness. Regardless, if it's not even that, it will be discipline to our cold hearts. Now, obviously, things are complicated for the moment. Strange that we would come to this passage when we've commanded our church to keep social distance. And that still is the command, right? And that is, and that's good for the time being, right? It's good for the time being to, for us to show that deference. And we cannot, you know, because of this situation, leave off the importance of physical touch. You know, we can't give that up. I mean, I was, what was I watching? Yesterday I was watching the, um, the space launch. And those men are hermetically sealed in those things, and yet at the end, right before they're about to take off, what do they do? They grab hands. Okay? They touch, those two astronauts touched hands. Um, interviews of people in these cities that are rioting. Some, some lady is breaking down because her house has been destroyed, and there's a lady standing next to her just rubbing her shoulder as she talked to the as she talked to the uh, interviewer, just rubbing her shoulder back and forth, you know, showing that kindness, showing that support for her, Those, that, 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 that importance of physical touch. We cannot forget how Jesus often healed with a touch, right? Even to the point of spitting on dirt and applying it to eyes, Right? We cannot forget the comfort the dying receive in being held, right? The dying receive comfort whether it's on their deathbed or it's in the battlefield, right? The dying receive comfort by being held by another person. We cannot forget the disarming effect of physical affection, and in due time, we will return to this, right? We will return to this and challenge ourselves with this. So enough on the kiss of love. The final statement in the book is what we might expect in a letter to brothers and sisters suffering for their faith in Jesus Christ. The apostle closes by, t- by talking of peace. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. Even in the midst of tribulation, the child of, of God can have peace. Peace. The Apostle Paul wrote, The Lord is near, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus, as he promised the Holy Spirit, said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Notice that the Apostle Peter, at the end of this book, pronounces peace on those who are in Christ, right? It says, peace be to you all who are in Christ. He does not generically pronounce a hope for world peace, right? He does not pronounce a peace on those who hate God. He does not pronounce peace generically and broadly. He pronounces peace on Christians. He does this because persecuted Christians need to be reminded that they they have a peace that is not merely outward like the, the fat and rich who seem to be at ease all the time, but that it is inward and eternal. Right? The peace we have now is a prelude to the peace we will enjoy in the eternal Sabbath ahead of us. 
the peace that Christians have and only Christians have was won by Christ as he propitiated the wrath of his Father. Christians know and delight in the peace that Christ has sufferingly won. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Christ and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, the Father, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through Him I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. And and so for those outside of Christ, we add what the Apostle Paul said at the end of his letter to the Corinthians. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be damned. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be anathema. He is to be accursed. Maranatha. Lord come. What a closing to a letter. Right? But there's a parallel here between what Peter and Paul are saying is that that the peace of God has come not generically upon the world. The peace of God has come to those whom God has claimed through his son Jesus Christ. For those in Christ Jesus, this promise from Deuteronomy. There is none like the God of Jeshurun. Rides the heavens to your help. And through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is a dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he drove out the enemy enemy from before you and said, destroy So Israel dwells in security, the fountain of Jacob secluded in a land of grain and new wine. His heavens also drop down dew. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. So your enemies will cringe before you and you will tread upon their high places. Amen.